So uh, at the outset, I'd, I'd like to say thank you to three people. Number one is Bill uh, to invite me to give this uh, talk presentation uh, and discuss ideas linked to ableism with uh, you. Number two is you people that you get here are willing to listen to these perspectives which I'll be sharing with you about ableism. And number three is Ruben who is just helping me out with all these logistics and uh, he's out there, uh, uh, it's very important. So uh, the uh, talk is titled Ableism and Lynn Gatha in Norway, Ableism, a blind alley in Norway, a uh, dark alley in Norway. And you might be wondering what is ableism. So my idea is that I hope that I could give some perspective on ableism and then you could discuss it with me more during the discussion section. So before we go forward, like a little bit about my biography, I'm a PhD fellow working at the Oslo Metropolitan University, Department of Social Work, Child Welfare and Social Policy. It's uh, pretty much on the opposite side of the street, Stensbergada 26, office number X666. That's the number. And uh, uh, what am I doing in my PhD? I'm comparing disability policies and labor market experiences of young adults with visual impairments between Oslo and Delhi. I was born and brought up in India. I am almost blind and I finished three masters, uh, special needs education, international social welfare and health policy, the second one, and the third one is this business and administration. So I have a little bit of an eclectic background of living and working in different countries and uh, studying different things. Yeah, so like let's go and have like a bit of a macroscopic perspective on how life is for people with disabilities worldwide. There are approximately 1 billion people with disabilities around the world, 470 to 480 million are of the working age. There are approximately 180 to 220 million young adults with disabilities. The vast majority of them, 80 to 90 percent, stay not in global north, not in developed countries, but in the global south. What is global south? Developing countries, parts of Africa, Latin America, South Asia. And what happens uh, when it comes to the employment situation for people with disabilities? Because that's my main forte, my main research interest is employment. Most of them do not get into employment, you know, and uh, there's a huge loss to the world economy. Trillions of dollars are lost because of the fact that they don't get into employment. Now, how is the situation in Norway? We are the best. Norway is the best when it comes to Human Development Index 2019 report. How many people with disabilities live in Norway? 17.6, 18% of the population has some kind of disability or impairment and uh, it's one out of five, you could say, and a vast majority of them, like they don't get into employment, 42 to 45 percent is the employment rate, whilst in the general population, the employment rate for people with disabilities happens to be around 75 or it could go as high as 80 percent. So, of course, Norway spends a lot on disability protection, approximately 4.3 percent of its GDP. It's one of the best countries, uh, one of the best welfare states. We all know about the merits of NAV and welfare state. But how are disabled people faring in Norway? Not very well, at least in the labor market. Norway is doing mediocre amongst OECD countries when it comes to the labor market inclusion for people with disabilities. Now. A little bit of understanding about what is disability and what is universal design. Now, I'm talking to a very uh, intellectually woke, uh, smart, intelligent, aware people. Uh, so I would assume that people know that the disability is predominantly understood as an interaction between an individual's impairment, like I having an impairment, and what kind of facility society pre provides to me. Uh, to participate or not. So that interaction between the individual and society leads to the impairment experience being amplified as disability. What is universal design? You all people know, you have done projects. The idea is pretty simple. We want to design products, services, programs and environment in a way which is usable by maximum number of people. Yeah. Wow, now I got it. I give a very simplistic definition of disability and be like, Gagan, is that real? Is that the only definition of disability? And the answer is absolutely no. The different conceptualizations of disability and disabled experience. The first starts with the philanthropic. If you think about it, for a vast majority of human existence, how were disabled people treated? They were treated with charity as people who gotta be taken care of, right? The idea was pretty simple. 
we want to give money to the disabled people. How many times have we uh, gone outside a church, a temple, a mosque, and we would have seen uh, people with disabilities, at least in the global south, that's pretty common experience. Or how many times have you know these advertisements come out where they want to promote this philanthropic idea of disability and saying that disabled people are really in a bad position in Africa, please go into the bottom of your heart, take out those 200 kronas which you'll be spending on your meal and give it to those people and feed those people and take care of them. We've done that, right? That's the philanthropic, tragic oriented, charity oriented understanding of disability. And then what happened in 18th century? 19th century when the germ theory came into existence. Germ theory is pretty simple, like we carry, started realizing that when I sneeze, it's not the demonic uh, 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 attack which I should be scared of, it's because influenza is attacking me. So that's a germ theory which kicked in. And they said, it's all about the pathology, the defect, the problems which the individual has. It's the fact if you are blind, that means that your photoreceptors in the eye are not working, functioning well, that's why you are blind. There's some problem with the retina. That's how you become blind and so on. So that was the 19th century. Then the story continued. And then we realized that what's happening with the economic understanding of disability. Of course, we think that, oh, disabled people, they cannot work. How can they work? They have such reduced working capacity. Can they even participate in the labor market? How do they live lives? You know, so we've got to give them, oh, for trade, disability pension, right? So it's like a very nice way of excluding them from the labor market participation. What is the sociological understanding of disability? Not only they cannot work, but also they cannot live a meaningful, productive, fulfilling, enriching life the way I do. And who is this I? The non-disabled person. It's like I have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Do disabled people have that? I don't know, perhaps they don't. I have a house, I have an apartment, I live independently. Can they live independently? You know? All these questions started to, you know, prop up. And these are very recent developments. These are like 40, 50 year old developments in the history of disability understanding. And the final is the socio-political understanding of disability, wherein they said, no, 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 we are the people with similar human worth, with similar rights. You cannot treat us as lesser humans. And all these understanding of disability it's very really important for you people to know that because when you are thinking about universal design and so on, your understanding of disability will determine your reaction, your response to ameliorate it, whether you see it as a cure, you've got to cure the problem, whether you want to take care of the problem, whether you want to treat them as equal individuals with equal worth, equal rights. All these things are very important for you to keep in back of mind of your mind. Talking about ableism, that's the thing which I, I, I was you know, asked me to come and talk about. So what is ableism? I, of course, we know about racism. What is racism? Racism is that when you find an individual and you see an individual who belongs to a different race, the moment you, you inst instinctively decide, determine that the other person is inferior, you assume that this person is of lesser worth, lesser value, and you don't take him or her that seriously and you oppress them or discriminate against them or manifest your prejudices. In the same way, when it comes to ableism, there is, it's in simple terms, it's the disability prejudice, but in a much more complex nuanced terms, it's a prejudice which is predicated upon abilities. I can go to ski in Threesil, I love that spot, and disabled people cannot do that, so of course their quality of life is a little poorer. That's ableism. I see a disabled person, a person uh, on a wheelchair going out in a restaurant and eating, and I instinctively think that he or she is eating with his or her assistant, and not necessarily their partner, their, their uh, husband or wife or girlfriend or boyfriend. I see a blind person walking on the street and I instinctively say, okay, let me just take the arm of this person because perhaps he or she is lost. You see what's happening out there? At the very subtle level, we are assuming we don't want to be ableists. At the core of our existence, at the core of our, in our hearts, we are like, no, 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 we are good people, we are kind people, we want to take care of the disabled people. But in the process of doing this caring business, 
We could very easily start thinking about them that, oh, these people are perhaps of less value, less worth than what I am. Because I am the norm. I'm the norm. If people don't go for skiing vacations, then there's something wrong with them. Because everybody should do that. So this whole idea about humanness, what is human, what is subhuman, it all gets problematized with this disability uh, discrimination or disability prejudice or ableism. But ableism is a bit more broader than the different words which have been used for to, ex to express, explain, explicate this problem of disability prejudice. People have used the word disabilism also. People have used the word funkophobia. What is funkophobia? Fear of lack of functioning. Yeah, makes sense. Disabilism, yes. Makes sense that you are prejudicial against people with disabilities. You think that they are not of equal worth. But ableism is a bit broader. It's not necessarily only about treating them with assumptions which are derogatory, which looks down upon them, which robs them of, from, of their humanity. But it could also mean that the moment you see a disabled person doing relatively simple task, you make him or her an inspiration porn. <gasps> what is inspiration porn? The idea is pretty simple. Me walking on the street should inspire no one. You know? You walk on the street, you take the tram, I take the tram. What's the big deal? So anything which unnecessarily inspires you, you should be inspired to fight for more equal justice, more inclusion, more disabled people being able to participate in the labor market, in the education, and have a much more meaningful, fulfilling life, but not necessarily treat them as quote unquote inspirational heroes or tragic victims. Very important. That's where ableism is so, so crucial because it has, it problematizes these two binaries, either a tragic victim or an inspirational hero. That's really crucial to keep that in mind. And of course, it comes from a cultural model of disability wherein we are thinking about disability, uh, uh, like what kind of stories we are telling, what kind of novels we are writing, what kind of theatrical performances we are having, how are disabled people portrayed in the media. That has a huge influence on the way we treat and understand disability and ableism. So, going on, these are some of the resources, which we, of course we could talk more about it. I've written lots of... Uh, opinion pieces uh, and I would like to give a shout out to Ruben he has helped me tremendously with uh, getting these things in um, much more precise incisive Norwegian my Norwegian is really poor as you might have guessed by now because I'm speaking in English so uh, like I wrote it for Minerva, Aftenposten, Watlane, Daxavisen there are lots of pieces and I've, I've participated in podcasts because I want to bring this term to Norwegian discourse, Norwegian ethos, Norwegian understanding because we are so quick and prompt in talking about for instance racism and sexism but what about disabilism or ableism? What about a, a thing which affects one out of five almost people because we all know of a grandmother who is old right who is not not feeling as strong as healthy as uh, effective as she was or for a father who is turning a little deaf in the ear who is finding hard to hear we might know of friends who are having disability or if we live long enough if we have a bad accident we can be disabled so it's so important to have that perspective in the head when we are thinking about disability and ableism that we are all temporarily able-bodied individuals. And the moment we have that framework in our heads, we'll be a lot more kinder, gentler, nicer, more inclusive. Universal design, I have given some talks about universal design. If you want to dig in, uh, feel free. Uh, it's about uh, how to create a much more inclusive uh, classroom environment if you have a disability or visual impairment, how, what did I learn when, uh, by being a professional with visual impairment, uh, organizing conferences uh, or like classroom presentations and so on, and what's the philosophy of universal design and how that intersects with uh, uh, very well with the ableism thoughts. And finally, the concluding ideas are pretty simple. Ableism is real. It does take place in Norway. It does take place in all the parts of the world because the truth is that, that we have taken disabled people or we have thought about them in a pejorative way for such a long period of time. 
It's for millennia. You know, the Bible says the lame shall walk, the blind shall see, and so on, right? Let's fix these people. The medical community has said, has said that. In the worst case, shall we exterminate them? You know, what the neo-Nazis, we often talk about the Holocaust, six million Jews which were lost, but what about the 240,000 disabled people who were exterminated during the Second World War? People don't know about these facts, you know? Because it's not, disability is something which cannot happen to me, my family. It's something outside, it's a bit far away. My point is this, that no, that's not the case. When you're thinking about universal design, when you're thinking about designing goods, services, products, environments, we've got to be, if you want to be really universal, really inclusive, we've got to have a much more honest conversation about what kind of assumptions we are having about impairments, about disability, and how do we treat disabled people. And that's where ableism is so important. And universal design could be used as a way to overcome the or combat the problem of ableism because we can be a little bit better and more enlightened in 21st century. Thank you. Now we just open for questions now or discussions and input from your end. Uh, no. Uh, uh, we, I, I don't have a Norwegian word for ableism, but what I was thinking is that if uh, uh, racism can become racism, okay. <laughs> sexism can become se what is sexism, <laughs> and able and ableism should be, that there should be a way in which we incorporate this into the uh, Norwegian language. That's a very good question, by the way, because I feel that uh, our language helps us to channelize our thoughts, which in turn affects our actions and behavior and if we have a word which could which like for instance the be instinctively kind of understand what is racism we might not be able to give a precise oxford cambridge webster uh, uh, definition of racism but we understand it that means that we we have a it helps you to uh, get a great grasp of the concept and uh, and uh, mobilize our collective imagination. So I think it's very, very important that we kind of expand this, uh, this course and, uh, and perhaps uh, smuggle the word ableism into Norwegian discourse the way we did it for racism and sexism. It'll be very helpful. I feel that. Yeah. I think I see a raised hand. Anna, yeah. did you raise your hand? Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, you know, in Norway we have like uh, NRK. Is there like a satsning uh, on uh, uh, changing the national view on disability? Because I think there has been progress in like how media portrays gay people, and I think in uh, NRK there's a lot of uh, programs that can you say this is Yes, uh, I, I think that's a very good observation. And, and as I said, like the needle has been moving. There was a time when people with disabilities would be only perceived as quote unquote objects of charity or tragic victims. But now mm -hmm. there are organizations in Norway, for instance, Norges Blinde Forbundet, Norges Handicap Forbundet, Oloba, FFU, Functions Hemeter Fellas Organization, and what they have been finding or doing is that they have been trying their work, are trying, trying a lot to change the narrative. Because at the end of the day, we cannot have only this pity oriented, charity oriented, tragic victim oriented narrative. So they're trying to push the needle to the other direction. But at the same time, what I, I'm really emphasizing is that at the end of the day, disabled people are people they are flawed they are frail they have uh, issues they have good days they have bad days they they have desires to become uh, to be mothers and fathers to have jobs to have hit the tooth and so on and they could be also mean and have jealousy and envy and so they are, so the point is to humanize disabled people not to treat them either as tragic victims or either as inspirational forms. 
or for, for your joy or delight because you want to feel good about yourself because you know doesn't it in a way you know when 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 a disabled people is when we do an act of kindness we have this nice warm fuzzy feeling of glow and joy don't we get that yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And, and we actually have, on some TV station, we have a very uh, hot topic uh -huh. in uh, dancing. Um, <laughs> have you been following that? I've heard about it. Yeah, please, yeah. <laughs> please educate me more. What was it? It's called Simply Ballroom or Alla Cadanza or yeah. something like that. And then uh, there's one person uh, participating in season wheelchair. Uh -huh. I think she's, a, she's an athlete. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen it myself, yeah. and and when I try to read about it in the media, I get so afraid of the dark, <laughs> because uh, yes, be, because they're saying yes, she's uh, she's moving forward in the competition, yeah. uh, because she's in a wheelchair, yeah. and and the judges they they see this person in a wheelchair, so a, a little bit uh, towards the direction you were saying disability poor, yeah. Uh, She's only getting a hat in this dancing competition because she's in a wheelchair. And this is unjust to the people that are, are competing and not in a wheelchair. Yeah. So um, I don't know if anyone has been watching this more closely than I have, but uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, to be honest, like, I have not watched that. I've heard about it from second and third hand. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and the important thing in that uh, debate would be the question of what is dance? What is, when, when we often say, oh, I'm walking around. Ah, I, I'm walking, I'm jogging, I'm running, I'm active, you know? And what if somebody says, I'm wheeling? What, wheeling? At the end of the day, we are moving, right? We are moving, from, I, I, I'm moving from here, to illustrated 48, 642, to, Stensburg Garda 26, office 666. And I'm walking, moving with my legs, and those people move with the wheelchair. So the question of movement gets problematized. In the same way, I think uh, we, we, we've got to have like a much more honest, open, um, a conceptual discussion about what is dance. And is it considered as a dance? If yes, then how do we measure it? How do we evaluate it? How do we not make it into a, 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 a pure case of only saying, wow, look at this person. She has made it here. We've got to give her the first prize. It's like, I don't want to give uh, um, President Barack Hussein Obama a Nobel Peace Prize just because of the fact that he uh, lives and breathes and he's, uh, he's the first black president. I would like to see his actions. I would like to measure how he, uh, what happened in Libya, what happened in Syria, and so on and so forth. So it's uh, symbolism is is okay, but it can, but it should not be tokenism. It should not go into that direction. I think that's very counterproductive. So um, you would, you would rather give it to Trump? No, <laughs> I would not give it to Trump at all. <laughs> A man of action. <laughs> I, would not give, I would not give it to Trump. I would not give it to Obama. None of the US presidents deserve it. I think I follow more like a Noam Chomsky uh, ideal of um, uh, uh, that all US presidents uh, should be tried for war crimes. <laughs> <laughs> or crimes against humanity. <laughs> That's what they deserve. So, anyone out there who wants to follow Anne's uh, lead and uh, yeah. ask a question? Or influence or comment or anything. Or, or tell us everything that you have, uh, anything that you have, uh, uh, Matt? Uh, hmm? Can I say something? Yes, welcome, Christina. Yes. Um, I'm not exactly sure what I'm trying to say here. I'm just thinking out loud. But uh, I was just thinking, uh, how do we actually put people with disabilities? And if it isn't actually listing of people who have ordinary lives, important step uh, for showing the other who are more ignorant that it's possible. And like the next step being treating them as everyone else. Aren't they very different steps in how to include people? Yeah. And the or are they the different steps to try to find out in the mouth? So do you mean that they they should get some of the 
a system that they have be, uh, because. Uh, uh, well, I'm just thinking that, for example, uh, you're saying that um, um, somehow uh, just appreciating or admiring that somebody with a disability does an ordinary thing. It's not what you should be doing, but maybe that's just the way to learn, including people. <laughs> Just by thinking that they are normal, just because they are. <laughs> um, I was just thinking that uh, it can seem as if uh, we're just looking at them as being uh, heroes, but maybe it's just a step towards including them as well. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think um, uh, I I'm sorry, like I'm not able to get uh, everything, Christina, because there's a bit of an echo in your uh, in whatever you said. But like from whatever oh, I gathered is. Uh, 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 like it's 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 really important to to incorporate them into the dialogue you know uh, it's we've got to understand that for instance you, you're hitting a very important point that uh, disabled people uh, like ableism is different from uh, racism I'll tell you how for instance imagine Martin and Muhammad and you both speak Norwegian really well and you both are supposed to just talk on phone it should not matter, you know, uh, uh, that, that you treat the one person better and the other person worse. You know, it's, it's a bad, bad idea. It's an abhorrent idea that you treat Muhammad inferior than Martin. But at the same time, for instance, when it comes to people with impairments, people with disabilities, there is a concept called as reasonable accommodation. You've got to make some accommodation for making things work for disabled people so that they could be as productive, as engaged, as involved, as effective as the non-disabled counterparts. So it kind of problematizes this question. And, uh, and, uh, and since we are talking about universal design, there's always this question about universal design or special accommodation. What should we do? Should we go in one direction of yes, it should all be universally designed for everybody to be able to use it and there should be no special accommodations at all? Like if you uh, if you are a, a a person with learning impairment, learning disability, and you take more time, you're dyslexic to read, to write, doesn't matter. You will be happy. You will be expected to give the assignment exactly in six hours, like the other participants. Or do we create other mechanisms, for instance? So we've got to have all those conversations. And I think you, you you're spot on with the idea that. Uh, it's very important to uh, not treat everybody with a sense of malevolence. I have a very simple rule, 90-10 rule. I think 90% of the uh, problems or misunderstandings happen because of ignorance and 10% are a product of malevolence. So I don't think that people necessarily, quote unquote, the non-disabled people go out to say, okay, Today, I'm going to really engage in an ableist behavior. And I'm gonna treat, mistreat a disabled person. I don't think people do that, no, no. But at the same time, there's a lot of ignorance and that's where the dialogue, that's where uh, putting this word out becomes so important. Because if the word goes out, then people say, oh, I understand, oh, is it about disabled people? Is it about prejudice? Oh then they start reflecting a little bit better and including people with disabilities as humans and not as subhumans or superhumans. Yeah, I don't know whether I answered your question or, uh, uh, completely, but it was a bit hard to hear uh, the uh, point which you were making. But can I just uh, add one more thing? Yes, please. Um, am I allowed to admire a person with a disability? Um, manages to have an ordinary life and an ordinary job um, without being accused of ableism. But uh, um, I admire maybe a person who manages that because I know there are lots of barriers out there and because it's, uh, it's maybe a tough part because it's not uh, uh, the same as for everyone else to actually manage that because they have to fight more. Yeah. Yeah, you, you have a right to admire them for the actions, uh, for their struggles uh, or their successes, but not because they can find a cup of coffee by themselves in no, the cafeteria. I, I <laughs>
Oh, this is actually a very good question, Christina, because because uh, that's that's you come a bit aware yeah. that because you do admire uh, mm. someone that has uh, barriers, mm. and and then then it has become a bit uh, you're a bit shy of showing that you think wow, but at the same time. I like to recognize every everyone that does something uh, extraordinary. I uh, would like to recognize the I don't know the the, the single mom or mm. or uh, every hardworking person out there. So why so why am I shy of uh, recognizing that the person in the wheelchair is is all, all over the place? Um, it's it's a uh, I think, uh, I think it's the ableism inside of me that I have to have a discussion with. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. I think uh, that, that's precisely the thing that uh, I want this word ableism to be out so that it could uh, lead to a much more uh, internal, much more critical reflection of our thought processes, of our assumptions, which we have. But at the same time, it we could discuss with other people that, okay, what are the... What are the Orders, what are the lines of admiration? What things should be admirable and what things should not be admirable? You know, like uh, uh, like getting a coffee by yourself or like uh, just getting up in the morning and coming out of the apartment should not be immediately admirable. You know, it should be much more nuanced uh, understanding. And what Christina was mentioning about uh, knowing the, about the, the struggles which they have gone through and the way they push towards the operating word which Christina used was ordinary people uh, leading an ordinary life. It's a very, very common uh, popular uh, phraseology which is used for uh, saying that disabled people like any other people are just people. Disabled people are people. Uh, I was just wondering if I could ask a question. Yeah. Uh, because we have this uh, field task or whatever we can call it, mm -hmm. uh, where we're going to uh, yeah, our group had uh, cinemas, uh, and we're just wondering, like, uh, when people with uh, vision impairment, uh, do they use the cinema? <laughs> That's a fanta <laughs> fantastic uh, question, yeah. Uh, I, I think the answer is yes, uh, uh, but it depends upon, like, what kind of uh, vision impairment are we talking about? Are we talking about people who are, uh, who are completely blind, who cannot see nothing? and they want to use cinema or do, do, there are people who have severe visual impairment and then there are people who have moderate visual impairment and then there are people who have mild visual impairment. Who are these people, you know, they're talking about, but, but a good starting point uh, to understand this would be Netflix. Netflix has an option of uh, audio, <coughs> audio described content. So for instance, you know, you, 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 you go to Black Panther movie, you click on it and then there's an option of, do you want to be audio described? And then you click on audio describe and then they would describe the whole movie for you, you know, for those people who don't see. And it's actually a very, very fascinating, enriching experience. I've watched it uh, two years ago and I was like, whoa, this is great. <laughs> and um, yeah, so uh, when it comes to movies as well, there, there, there are these options as well. Uh, but they are not very well discussed and that's a classic example of specialized accommodation or uh, in case of movies or you could consider it as a bro under the broad rubric of universal design we want the movies to be accessible to vision impaired people so we want it all the movies all the content to have uh, you know audio description or sign language interpretation or like subtitles which we already have yeah on, on that note, you might ask, uh, has anyone been to the movies, <laughs> to the cinema recently? Uh, it's, it's been more uh, Netflix, and it, yeah. it, not only because of Corona, but going to the movies and to the cinemas is, is also, is it, is it this uh, high-tech uh, cinema with uh, surround sound, or is it the uh, little friendly one in, in Frogner with the uh, with wine bar and uh, yeah, <laughs> Luxus Pio. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a, that's a different question, a different discussion. Altogether. That's a whole different uh, cinema experience. Yeah, true. Yeah. true. Uh, yes, uh, any else? Anyone else out there? Thank you to the people that are asking questions uh, from oh, yes. the outside. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. can, I, uh, can I say something? 
Yes. Of course. Okay, I mean, yeah. Uh, I just thought it was uh, interesting what you said about the inspiration port. <laughs> because um, uh, a few years ago we had um, a TV show in Norway, which was, um, they gathered a lot of uh, people with different disabilities mm -hmm. and put them to the top of a mountain. And it was supposed to be like this big, um, inspiring thing that anyone can go to the top of the mountain, no matter what disability you have. Yeah. Um, and one of the contestants, he was uh, paralyzed, mm -hmm. uh, and he he said, well, he had a very good um, facilitated home uh, with the different moving aids, and and he managed his life so well. So he never really thought about being disabled. Yeah, it wasn't really something that he felt that he was disabled. Mm -hmm. Um, and then he said, after going on this trip, that was the first time in his life that he felt disabled. Uh, <laughs> so I think him being forced to be on this, well, he wasn't forced, but him being on the show kind of was for us to be inspired and for him to kind of feel bad. <laughs> yes, actually that's, uh, that's a fantastic point. And I think that point uh, uh, suggests towards the debate of segregation. And, and inclusion, you know, specialized programs, specialized schools, specialized learning, specialized teaching for disabled people make you internalize that there's something wrong with you, you know, like if you are going to a special needs education program, I took that by the way, the masters, one of my masters is in special needs education at Linnan. Uh, I, I feel that that it segregation uh, is really detrimental in general but there are of course moments wherein you want to segregate voluntarily and have a sense of community you know like uh, when when women voluntarily segregate themselves and say these are groups only for women and we will talk about feminism how we could get equal pay for equal work and so on that is valuable but when it comes to just segregating people because okay yes let me just uh, pick up the bunch of like uh, five uh, minority kids and uh, and uh, follow them and say okay look at these kids they are doing so well at school and they there's no problem uh, uh, it's they have same opportunities as kids in the western part of Oslo I think we are we are missing the point you're missing the point and, and and we should really be very careful about popular stereotypes caricaturing uh, the individuals because these are individuals these are not group identities I'm an individual. I don't represent people with visual impairments. No, no. I belong to that group, but I don't represent no one. So you've got to know how to uh, treat people as, uh, as uh, individuals and not like uh, uh, go to the extreme and say, okay, here are these 10 people. And uh, as you said, like uh, the, the person started feeling disabled for the first time. <laughs> Because he was, he was pushed to internalize that, perhaps, in that setting. Yeah. A great question or a great point. Anybody else? Yes, there's a raise hand from Anne. On what in the that I was just think I was just thinking is positivism from. Uh, divided from ableism in the, the viewing that everyone is an individual. Of, um, I'm thinking if I were to view anyone with the blindness as to being as able as you are, that would also be negative for many people. Yes, it's, it's, it's the fine line between uh, yeah. accommodation yes. and, 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 and uh, universal design and, and respect. It's, it's about finding, if I understand you correctly, Anna, it's about being somewhere on the spectrum 
between uh, where you accommodate or you just expect uh, um, that anybody can do anything. <laughs> No, I, I agree with you. Like, uh, I, I think this is precisely what I've, I've been trying to explicate right now. That, for instance, segregation and inclusion, you know, or for instance, universal design and special accommodation, all, all these things are uh, you, you've got to walk on the tightrope and you've got to make sure that you don't end up uh, weaponizing it. For instance, segregation. When it's forced, it's really bad, but voluntary segregation, who stops me to segregate myself from this group? Away. There should be a freedom, right? So it's like a very, very complex, uh, these are very complex uh, themes and topics. And, and my idea out here to come out, uh, out and talk about ableism is precisely this, that I want these conversations to happen. I want people to reflect about their normative assumptions or uh, to reflect on what kind of thoughts they have about impairment, what kind of stories they're being told about impairment or disabled people, how should they treat disabled people, what's the best way to deal with the disabled people when they meet them in social settings, at the movies, in the bar, and so on. So uh, that's, that's why uh, the word ableism is brought out, yeah. Okay, I think uh, we have used up your, your time, uh, but uh, I think we're surely inspired to <laughs> Google you and uh, keep, uh, keep watching uh, and uh, finding out the things that you are uh, putting out there. Oh, thank you, Bir, for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Like, uh, uh, and thanks for your time, people. Thank you. Thank yes. Bye-bye. We can give applause here in the room and then the people at home can... Uh, you know, give the small... Uh, Just make the... <laughs> the hands. <or. laughs> no, I think actually this is the first time that we have uh, raised the question of ableism at the OT study. Mm -hmm. So this is... Uh, we will be coming back to you for more oh. in the coming year. We have a whole new uh, program plan also coming up. So, yes. <laughs> Sounds fantastic. Thank yeah. you. Thank you.